Chapter 60, Tuesday, 1.46 p.m. I believe it was a Wednesday. It was definitely midweek, but I knew I had a very interesting weekend ahead because on the following Friday, I had a booking from a strippogram agent in Wimbledon. Plus, I was booked to perform as a podium dancer in a nightclub in Hamill, Hampstead. Now, for the Saturday night, I was in for a little bit of a challenge. Because up until then, I was getting work from two agents. One that didn't give me that much work, but the other that gave me a lot of work. However, the one that gave me a lot of work, there was a bit of a catch. Because the rate of pay that he gave wasn't as good as the other agent. But what gave him the edge was the volume of work that he would offer me. But... On this particular weekend, I got approached by a different agent altogether. Now with her, her rate of pay was really good. But the only catch was you hardly got any work from her. But on this weekend, she had three bookings. Which meant doing three of her bookings was doing like five or six bookings of the other guy that gives me a a lot of work. So in short, going out for Julie would be less work but more money. It was just a pity that her work wasn't as regular as the agent known as Tony. So in order to avoid confusion, I shall give you the names of the agents as we go along. Now we arrive at Friday night. I went down to South London to Wimbledon, do my little stripogram, got paid for that. Then I made my way up to Hertfordshire to Hamill Hampstead. The nightclub was called Ephros. Now, I didn't have to be there till after 10. So I took a pretty slow drive from Wimbledon up to Hamel Hampstead. Now, it had been a good eight months or so since I danced in a podium. But it felt good to be back in a podium doing my tricks and impressing the crowd and yada, yada, yada. Now, while I was on my break in the changing room with the other dancers, that's when it kind of hit me. I thought to myself, well... You're in this nightclub. You're in here for about four hours, working quite hard, using a lot of energy, dancing in the podium. And you're going to be walking away with about 70 quid. Whereas you did a 10 minute stripogram in Wimbledon and you made the same amount of money for a whole lot less work. And that's when I realized my ego clouded my judgment. Because from a businessman's point of view, my decision to work as a podium dancer that night was insane. It was ridiculous. You're doing like four or five hours of freaking hard work in a podium, making the same amount of money for doing like a 10 minute performance that doesn't even require a quarter of the energy of dancing in a podium. And you're going to make the same amount of money for 10 minutes. <laughs> Well, it's a no brainer. And that's when I arrived at the decision not to do podium dancing ever again. So I left that nightclub. Yeah, I got paid, but I felt like a mug. I felt like an idiot. I'm thinking, wait, how could you have been so stupid to waste your time in a podium just for the sake of ego? Wow. Now we arrive at Saturday morning. Now, this was a morning I was dreading. Because I knew the agent, Tony, was going to be calling me anytime soon with a list of bookings. But I already knew that I agreed to work for Julie that night because I couldn't resist her three well-paid jobs in place of Tony's four, five, maybe six less paid jobs for the same amount of money. No brainer once again. So my mobile phone rang. It was Tony. But I had to give him some bullshit story about how I suspected I had food poisoning and I just had the runs and the shits and I wasn't going to be doing no work on that night. Of course, he was devastated because I had a good reputation. You know, I've got good feedback and he really relied on me because I was really reliable. He even suggested that I call him back later to see if I feel better because he was so desperate to give me these jobs. But I thought, no, I just I can't. I can't walk away from Julie's, you know, earners. So Saturday night arrived and I did my first job for Julie. Now, I can't remember exactly where it was, but I sure the hell remember the second one. 
I made my way to a place called Sunbury on Thames. Call it South West London for argument's sake, near Heathrow Airport. The venue was called the World Ends Pub. The occasion was a hen party for a woman who worked for the Italian national airline Al Italia. She was an air hostess. They requested a fireman and the arrangement was that I had to call the organiser outside the pub. So when I got outside the pub, I called the contact number, asked for Angela and I told her I'm the stripper. I'm waiting outside. She told me, wait there. She'll meet me in a second. I was standing down the end of the pub, slightly past the pub, and she came out from the door right on the opposite end from where I was standing. As she came out, she looked her left, looked her right, and then she saw me and she started running towards me. And that is where it happened. Just like the first time when I saw Zoji and when I saw Elizabeth, I was experiencing an oh my God moment. It was like as though she was running in slow motion. I know it sounds corny, but I my my jaw slightly dropped as she was running towards me. She had the exact build that I like, my ideal build. Now, I can't honestly say what her dress size was, but I could only guess from an amateur man's point of view. She's probably from a size 14, possibly up to a size 18. But I'll hazard a guess more around a 16-ish mark. But all I know, she had the most attractive curves. She resembles like the Virgin mascot on the Virgin airline. She was busting out of her jeans and she had a, like a, a, a denim top that was quite short, but she, she was just curvy. She was curvy as fuck. And she had short, Jet black hair, pretty round face and big brown eyes. Now, I'm five foot nine tall. When she was talking to me, she was looking up at me. So the angle I say that she was staring up at me, I'd put her around five foot five, five, six. Now, this is going to sound so corny, I know. But while she was talking to me, it was like as though her sound was all muffled. It's like I couldn't hear what she was. I was just looking at her. Yeah, you know when you see those cartoons where you've got, a, let's say you you've got a um, dog that hasn't eaten for ages, and then um, he comes across uh, I don't know maybe a cat or something, and he doesn't see the cat, he just sees like a cooked bit of chicken. So it was kind of like that. I was just looking at her, thinking, "Oh my god, I just want to hug you up and kiss you." Anyway, so I went in. I did my performance. They loved the performance and they, they, they was really happy with the performance. And when I found out, of, of course, they're Italian. All of them were Italians, including Angela. You know, I showed off with a little bit of Italian that I knew because when I was trying to he get her to follow my instructions and she didn't follow the instructions, I said, ah, capale. And they all started laughing because capale is like the uh, equivalent of bollocks. But I have to admit, while I was doing my performance, I could feel my stare was drawn to Angela. So we arrived at the end of the performance. I got paid, said my goodbyes, made my way to the car. Danny was sitting in the car waiting while all of this was happening. So when I got into the car, I put the key in the ignition and I froze. I looked over at Danny and I said, Danny, I really like that woman. I really fancy that woman really badly. And a part of me just wants to go back in there and tell her. But there's another part of me thinking, oh, but I'm a stripper. I didn't know what to do. And Danny said, well, you only live once, you know, strike the iron while it's hot. Ah, oh, fuck it, I'll go in. What have I got to lose? So I went back. Now, the women, they were quite excited and happy to see me again. And they were even more excited when I said, oh, I just want to speak to your friend, Angela. And they were like, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So I said to her, and, I, and uh, it was in front of everybody. And so Angela said, well, what, what, what do you want to talk about? I said, well, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, um, I'm, I don't mean to embarrass you, but I quite like you. And one of the friends said, well, I think Angela 
Angela likes you too, because when she came in from outside, she said, oh, he's gorgeous, he's gorgeous. Then Angela said, you must have lots of women chasing you because you're so good looking. And I immediately thought, is she being sarcastic or is she being genuine? Because remember my face analogy that I made earlier on when I compared a man's face to music and I classed my face as funk, which has a following, but it hasn't a large following or a commercial following such as mainstream pop or R&B and hip hop. So in short, as I've stated many times, I don't class myself as classically good looking. And also you have to consider even though my rebirth was many years ago, and since then, I became a fully skilled battlefield dainting ranger. The ghost from Christmas past was probably still lurking around in my subconscious. The memories of high school of being underrated, being called ugly. So despite my fitter than average man body and all the skills I have to go with it, that spotty, insecure Lack of confidence, teenage boy sometimes emerges now and again. However, that did not remove the responsibility on my side to give an answer to her statement about having lots of women chasing me. Now, you have to remember, this was early days in my stripping career. The wild style was still yet to come, even though things was getting warm in the kitchen of my stripping career. So the answer I gave her was an honest answer. And I meant it with every fibre in my being. And I said to her, you are left with one of two choices. Choice number one, I could either tell you what I think you want to hear. Or choice number two, you spend time with me and you get to know me and you see for yourself whether I'm genuine or whether I am full of shit. I could sit here and tell you, no, I don't meet lots of women. But you would never know whether I'm telling you the truth until you actually get to know me. Sadly, that's the only options you've got. Then the bride-to-be said, oh, tell me the truth right now, I want to know the truth. And I thought, well, you haven't listened to a word I've said. So I said, well, my lifestyle is not as fast lane as you think it is, it really isn't. But as I stated before, you won't know that unless you get to know me. Anyway, to my delight, she agreed to meet up with me at a later date. Plus, we had each other's phone number anyway. I left that pub on such a high, it was like as though I won a lottery ticket worth, I don't know, 100 million. I was up there in the clouds. I was so focused on her, I can't even remember the last job I did that night. Sunday morning when I woke up, she was the first thing on my mind. She was on my mind more or less all day. I was all excited about the possibility of getting things right this time. Maybe that might have been a flaw on my side due to past failures with Zhoji and Elizabeth. But all the same, I was still focusing on, wow, what if things go right with me and her? Where could things actually go? However, I adhered to my dating battlefield ranger training, even though I wanted to call her that day. I wanted to call her first thing in the morning when I woke up. I adhered to the rules. You keep your cool. You do not appear desperate or thirsty, as they say in America. So against all my urges, I made my mind up that I'll call her on Monday. Monday had now arrived. I was back at work in my day job as a lorry driver. I was no longer working for John Lewis. I was now a temp which was ideal because I was more flexible to do other stuff like possibly television auditions or even stripper game jobs. So we get to Monday evening and it was just like reliving the days of Zoji all over again. I couldn't wait to give her a ring. When I got home, I was like an excited puppy dog, uh, excited to see his or her master with my tongue hanging out. I dialed the number on my mobile phone, the phone rang, Hello, and she was quite well spoken. Hello, hi, it's Ron. Oh, hi, how you doing? And I said, yeah. Um, so, how's things? Like, and she said, oh, things are fine. And it's yeah. 
And um, she asked me, hey, did you have a good weekend? I said, yeah. Did you do any other, what was the other job like? Yeah, it was okay. I said, but of course your job was the best. And she laughed and and uh, she told me that she worked as in, in advertisement. So the conversation was flowing quite well. And it was starting to get to the end of the phone call. And she said, okay, well, um, I've got to go now. So I'll speak to you soon. I said, oh, hold on a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, I thought we was going to arrange with meeting up with each other at some point. And she said, oh, I'll get back to you on that. And that's when my heart sank. I was crushed. It was like as though someone said to me, you know that 100 million pounds you thought you won on the lottery? I'm afraid to tell you that wasn't the winning ticket. You didn't win anything. I had been around the block enough times to know that when a woman says that to a man, that means that's a very polite way of saying, no, I don't want to meet up with you. I'm being very polite to talk to you on the phone and I probably shouldn't have given you my phone number or I shouldn't have allowed you to give me a ring, but I'm in this situation now and you've rung and I don't know what to say to you, but I don't want to meet up with you. And that, that was a very polite way of saying it. The writing on the wall was loud and clear. And this was not the days of the curse of the nice guy where I would ignore the writing. No, no, no. By now, I was a well-experienced battlefield dating ranger. And I, I, I knew it from the time I heard it. There, there was just no getting around it. So I said, OK, then. All right. Well, um. Well, I'll, I'll speak to you later then. And she said, okay, well, bye. And I put the phone down. And then I just reluctantly ripped her phone number up and threw it because I thought to myself, I don't want to humiliate myself and ring her up knowing that she doesn't want to meet me. And I thought if I destroy her number and delete her number from my phone, there's just no way I'm going to get egg in my face. You know, because, you know, uh, though I decided to get rid of her number, I thought myself, but if I didn't, you know, I may change my mind in a few days. And I thought, well, look, leave it like this. If she's interested, she will call you back. If she doesn't, well, there you go. But I knew, I just knew I was not going to be getting a phone call from her. So, of course, you start to replay the last 48 hours. You start thinking back to the time you met her. You thought about the mood she was in and how she spoke to you on the Saturday night. And that's when I started to think about things logically. I thought she probably had a few drinks on the Saturday night, merry as hell. And, you know, it seemed OK on the night. It seemed like fun on the night to flirt with a stripper. And probably when she woke up Sunday morning, she probably thought, oh, my God, what the fuck have I done? And there was another angle I didn't think of until then, which was from her point of view, on a long term basis, how would she explain this to her parents? Because after all, she originated from Italy. Now, just because I was very fortunate to come across a really welcoming Italian family, that does not mean lightning will strike the same place twice. Hello, Mama and Papa. My new boyfriend. Oh, by the way, he's a stripper and he's also black. Now, maybe, just maybe, I could have got round the black part. But the stripper, I think that would be the nail in the coffin. Then there's the public perception that I'm a player. I live a wild lifestyle. And from her point of view, why would she go through all the hassle of the insecurity that she may or may not have or all the sort of worrying about where would I be? Where am I right now? And how many jobs I've got to do the following weekend? Am I going to meet an, another woman like her? And do I do this all the time? Now, looking at my dating journey thus far, on the surface, it would appear that I am a player. It would appear that I do live a fast lane lifestyle, certainly compared to the average man. But remember the reason why that is simply because of bad luck in love. 
had Zhou and Elizabeth chose me and said, I want to be with you, Ron, I wouldn't have led that lifestyle. The preferable choice for me would have been to be either with one of them, but both of them didn't want what I wanted. So what can I do? And the crazy thing about Angela is I knew that if I carried on liking her the way that I liked her, if my feelings didn't change and they excelled from that point, I would have been all hers. I absolutely would not have cheated on her because once I've got a hot for a woman, it's tunnel vision. There could only be one queen on my throne. For me, it's only one or two ways. I'm either painting a town red as a wild single man or I'm the most dedicated boyfriend a woman could have. But even that could have a downside because as sweet as it sounds, I know that women sometimes get bored. They get bored of the dedicated guy. They, they like a bit of excitement, a bit of mystery. So if a guy's doting on them too much, that can work against the guy. So now we arrive at Tuesday. I'm back at work. But now my mood is somber. I'm feeling down. I'm driving my lorry. And I'm just thinking of what could have been had she just gave me a shot. I was thinking, if you just gave me the chance, and she just gave me the benefit of the doubt, you know, she could have probably seen that wouldn't have been as bad as she thought I would have been. Uh, I was just so kind of guided. I was thinking about her in the morning. I was thinking about her at lunchtime. I was thinking about her at 1.46 p.m. While I was thinking about Angela on that afternoon at 1.46 p.m., this was taking place. It was 8.46 in the morning. That's when this stopped even resembling a normal day. This just in, you were looking at a, obviously a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center, and we have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. The CNN Center right now is just beginning to work on this story, obviously calling our sources and trying to figure out exactly what happened, but clearly something relatively devastating happening this morning there on the south end of the island of Manhattan. That is, once again, a picture of one of the towers of the World Trade Center. Well, you can see these pictures. It's obviously uh, something devastating has happened. And again, unconfirmed report that a plane has crashed into one of the towers there. We are efforting more information on this subject as it becomes available to you. They say you remember exactly where you was when a disaster takes place. Tuesday, September the 11th, 2001 has two memories for me. First, the second Wonder Woman, wondering what could have been had she gave me the chance. Maybe she could have been the best thing that ever happened to me. Maybe I or her could have been the worst thing that happened to either one of us. And of course, the other memory, the day that changed the world. The most unique audiobook ever recorded. Welcome to the Tales from the Little Black Book. One man's journey on the dating scene. It is available now on Rakuten Kobo.